Hi, I'm Darren and welcome to Level Up Double E Lab. In today's episode, I'll be revisiting my spectrum analyzer project. In particular, looking at some shortcomings in the IF gain and noise floor and seeing if replacing the original circuit board with a newer design offers any improvements. This is the third video in what is essentially now a series of videos I've done on the Spectrum Analyzer project. The first couple went through the background, theory of operation, and some of the construction techniques that I used. Now the focus of today's video would be a very specific problem I'm having with the IF gain amplifier and the associated noise floor. So I'll get started by setting up the Spectrum Analyzer and demonstrating the exact condition that I'm talking about. Okay, I've connected the spectrum analyzer up to my trusty 465 so we can take a look at the condition I was describing about the IF amplifier. And right now, what I've got uh, as far as input, I've got the uh, signal generator, my HP signal generator set to 20 megahertz. And right now there's no uh, output signal. Uh, this is just the, the effective noise floor of the spectrum analyzer. And what I'll do, I'll turn on the signal generator right now and that's a minus 30 dB um, signal. And what I can adjust here is that IF gain control, and I'm gonna move it down and back up. And what I'm trying to do per the specification is get that thir minus 30 dB signal to be at the top radical on the scope. So this guy right up here is where I'd like to get it. But now watch what happens to the noise floor as I crank up the IF gain. As I approach minus 30 dB at the top, you can see the noise floor comes up and I'm almost out of range on the IF gain control now. In fact, if I push it any further, the noise floor really comes up as I overdrive that amplifier. So effectively, I'm, I'm struggling to be able to get to minus 30 dBm at the top grad radicule, and that's the condition I'm trying to rectify with this IF amp change. The second one is to try to get this noise floor lower. So I turn the signal off, and really this should be down into the middle of this next range, radical so almost another 10 db lower so those two things are what i'm going to try to fix with this improved amplifier here's the schematic and key cat and i'll go through these changes next but before i do one additional comment on the gain headroom issue i don't think the issue is being caused by a weak signal coming out of the resolution filter if you recall, that's the stage immediately prior to this IF amplifier. I've checked the signal strength coming out of the resolution filter and it seems to be fine. So getting into the circuit, there's two improvements that I'm going to try here and see if they help. The first is to increase the total available gain by adding an additional 2N3904 common base amplifier stage immediately prior to the AD603. This added amplifier comes from a suggestion from adding IF gain from Wes's 2008 updates and it provides an additional 9 dB of gain. Not sure if the real purpose was to solve my exact issue or not, but boosting the signal ahead of the AD603 will certainly help from maxing out on the AD603's range. The second improvement is to redesign the physical layout of the board to adopt additional best practices for minimizing noise. I've studied the application guides from analog devices more thoroughly, Plus, I've scoured the internet for guidance on how to lay out RF circuits for minimizing noise. So one of the recommendations from AD was to minimize differences in ground potentials between the AD603 and the AD8307. I changed the design to use a local star ground connection between those two chips and the ground plane. So in theory, that will help reduce any minor differential ground signals between those two ICs and reduce the noise. Oh, and another change I made specifically to try and reduce noise was to use more modern low-noise linear regulators than the decades-old LM317 and 78L05 that are on the existing board. So I chose the ADP7118 low-noise regulator from Analog Devices. Its specs are 11 microvolts noise that's independent of the output voltage, while the older LM317 is much higher at 30 microvolts per volt output. I know, noise parameters are more complex than just a single line on a datasheet, but for sure, using this newer AD device has to be directionally the way to go. 
Since I was already tearing everything up, another change I decided to incorporate was to use AD's reference design for the bandpass filter between the two chips. They show a Murata ceramic 10.7 MHz bandpass filter between them. I did some searching and found that that part is obsolete, but Murata makes a modern surface mount version that's very similar to the one shown in the reference guide, and it's super tiny. It's less than 4 mm square. The bandpass filter on the stock design is an LC network of discrete parts, and it takes up considerably more space on the board, and also required adjustment to reach the correct 10.7 MHz center frequency. This off-the-shelf ceramic filter has good specs. Bandwidth is 180 kHz, which compares favorably with the stock filter's bandwidth of about 200 kHz. Now, it does have an insertion loss of 4 dB nominal, which is a bit concerning given that I'm trying to get more gain from these changes, but I also don't know what the insertion loss of the stock design is to compare it to. And here's the bare board. Now, for this particular project, I decided not to etch it myself, mainly because I wanted solder mask to make soldering that tiny ceramic filter in those SOIC-8s easier. So I went to an outside house and for less than 10 bucks, including shipping, I got three bare boards in about three weeks. And they turned out very nice. And here's one of them populated. I did all the soldering by hand. I'm getting good at surface mount soldering, but for sure, this board pretty much pushed my ability to the limit. I think I'll stick with nothing smaller than 0805 whenever possible. That's about the tiniest part I can do. And as I said, having solder mask made soldering the fine pitch ceramic filter in the ICs a lot easier. Okay, let's take a closer look at the existing IF and log amplifier circuit. And as a refresher, it's this box here right in the center of the screen. Nearby is the time base board down here. And this is the input coming into the IF and log amplifier coming from the resolution filters over here. And then the output right here goes off to the log cal pot. So I'm going to zoom in here so we can take a closer look at the circuit construction itself. And I'll go ahead and take the cover off the box so we can see inside. And the way that this is laid out, again, here is the input coming in uh, from this side here. I know most of the components are not visible because they're on the other side of the circuit board, but essentially the circuit flows from this side to the other side. And in between the IF amplifier and the log amplifier, this is that bandpass filter that was made from discrete components. And for good RF practice, I do have feed through capacitors for the IF potentiometer gain control. That's the pot that's down here on the front panel of the spectrum analyzer. Uh, the, the power coming in also has a feed through capacitor as well. Now, just for size comparison, I'll lay on top just to show the relative uh, size reduction that I've done with the new PC board. So there's plenty of room in this box. In fact, it's going to swim in here, but that's actually good. That'll be uh, much easier for me to be able to make the uh, coax, connect, coax connections to the board. And that's one of the other improvements I'm going to make is actually use short pieces of RG316 to make the connections instead of just short pieces of hookup wire. So now next step is I'm going to have to disassemble this box and take out the old PC board and put in the new one. I've finished installing the circuit board in the housing and as I mentioned it does swim in there. There's plenty of room all the way around and that really did help making these connections both the input and the output. Now I did change my mind on how to make this connection. Originally I said I was going to replace this input and this output with short sections of RG316, but as it turns out there just wasn't enough length there in order to fit a small piece in. By the time I would have gotten done with the two terminations, there would have been less than an eighth of an inch of actual jacket uh, on the coax. So I just went with a twisted pair, and reality is this signal's around 10 megahertz. This signal coming out here is much, much lower in frequency, so I don't think it's going to be a big deal at all. Another thing I want to comment on here is my use of feed-through capacitors, and I'll show a little inset video here of how I built that, but the challenge is you need feed-through capacitors whenever you're dealing with a shielded RF enclosure like this to stop 
the RF from traveling along the, the conductor, either out of the housing or into the housing. Now, the challenge is you can't solder these feed-through capacitors to thick wall aluminum. You just can't. You just won't get it hot enough. And trying to solder to aluminum is a pain to begin with. So my solution was just take a thin strip of printed circuit board and solder the feed-through capacitors to that and then just have slightly larger through holes in the housing for the feed-throughs to stick through and then just use some fasteners, in this case some um, number four size fasteners, to hold that assembly, that print circuit board assembly and feed through capacitors to the wall of the housing. That's a little, cl- little kludgy, but it does work. And like I say, it gets around the challenge of trying to solder those things to aluminum. Now, for sure, you can buy these with a threaded attachment, but they're considerably more expensive. And these are available um, you know, in packs of 10 for a pretty economical price. So I just came up with my own solution to get them to work. Okay, I put the spectrum analyzer back together and I've got it set up with my function generator and my trusty oscilloscope. And what I'm going to do is repeat the experiment I did at the beginning of the video. I'm going to output a 20 megahertz signal from the function generator and adjust the level of the signal and then see the response on the oscilloscope and also see the effect on the noise floor when I adjust the IF gain on the spectrum analyzer. Now in order to to show a clearer picture I'm going to readjust the camera to focus just on the 465 screen and it'll be a little tricky (laughs) anytime you're trying to film a glass screen with uh, very high contrast it's uh, hard to get a good picture but I'll try anyway so here we go. All right, I made a few adjustments in the camera angle here to try to get the best picture I can on the 465 screen. And of course, it's going to flicker a bit because they're uh, out of sync, uh, the scope and the camera that is, they're not synchronized. But nonetheless, I think you can see what's going on here. So the signal generator is putting out minus 30 dBm right now. And I'll start dropping it in 10 dB increments. And I do have it recalibrated so that it's moving one scope division per db so i'm down to 90 or minus 90 dbm and we're at the bottom of the screen and down in the noise so right away i see that i'm a little disappointed (laughs) i made this change to the amplifier hoping that i was going to get a lower noise floor and i'm really not but i did get quite the increase in headroom on the if amp so i'm going to dial back on the if gain now and you can see i can bring the signal way down And when I bring it back up to the minus 30 dBm, I still have quite a bit of adjustment left on it. But you can see there goes that noise floor way up. So not exactly what I was hoping for, but there is a marginal improvement there in the IF gain. So what to do next? So let me shut the signal generator off and I'll turn the IF gain all the way down. And the noise floor is still not as low as I'd like it. It's not where I thought I would push it down to. So I think what I'm going to have to do next is just isolate the log amp from the variable gain amp and see if there's just inherently that much noise coming from the log amp by itself with the way I've got it packaged or if maybe this is the realistic limit for that variable gain uh, AD603 IF amp. So a little more experimentation is going to be next. As it turns out, I've got a pretty easy way to interrupt the signal flow and isolate just the AD8307 log amp and downstream op amps. I can remove R18. It's a 330 ohm resistor that's used along with R20 to impedance match the ceramic filter. And here is R18. I've got good access to it from both sides, and I don't even need to remove the board from the chassis to desolder it. Here's the spot after desoldering R18. Oh, and pay no attention to my crappy soldering job on C8. Okay, let's see what it looks like now. I set the channel input to ground to re-zero it, so now I'll switch it back to DC and the trace is noise free. So that's good, that's what I would have expected. But why does the trace come up at all? Well, even with zero input, the log amp does output approximately a quarter of a volt, which could scale to about a half a volt after going through the CA3140 op amp and log cal pot. So experiment finished, I put R18 back in, and here once again is the response to the 20 MHz minus 30 dBm signal. For an apples to apples comparison with the analyzer before I swapped in the new board, I need to engage some video filtering. So here's what the response looks like with low video filtering engaged. 
Comparing this to the response before I installed the new amp board, you can see that there is an almost 5 dB reduction in the noise floor. Not the 10 dB I wanted, but nonetheless a partial success. And as an unexpected bonus, the skirts of the response are more symmetrical. Perhaps the Murata ceramic filter is more balanced than the prior discrete component filter. That's just a guess, but in any case, I'll take it. So at this point, I'd have to say I'm finished with chasing this IF gain and noise floor issue. I did get a pretty nice boost in the overall gain of the IF uh, adjustment, but the noise floor did miss my expectation of 10 dB. I guess I'll just live with uh, 5 dB. And besides, there's several other things that I need to address on this analyzer, and here they are in no particular order. The first item is an easy item. I have to replace the frequency adjust potentiometer. Now this one is a 10 turn unit and it had great resolution, but I bought it surplus and I guess I got what I paid for because it broke and it's not working in about two thirds of its travel. So easy fix, but expensive. They're about $15 new. So I'm just gonna you know, bite the bullet and buy a new one and swap it out. The second item has to do with the amplifier stage right after the second mixer. That uses a 2N5109 transistor. Now that circuit does dissipate about 600 milliwatts and I do have a heat sink on that transistor but I'm thinking it's a bit too small because it just seems too hot to the touch after it warms up for about 10 minutes or so. Um, there is a vent in the cover. I think I've shown that before and uh, that screen does let some natural convection help, but I, I think that's not enough. I need to get something in there that'll dissipate uh, more heat. Now trying to find uh, those TO39 transistors and heat sinks, it's a bit like chasing a, a technology dinosaur. You can still find them if you look hard enough, but they're getting rarer and rarer. Now the third one gets into chasing the Spurs game. Anybody that's worked on spectrum analyzers or um, even uh, any kind of uh, super heterodyne receiver circuit knows that that can be challenging. And I do have a challenge here to get rid of some uh, Spurs that are kind of aggravating. In particular, there's two that are showing up, uh, one at 48 megahertz and a second at about 74 and a half megahertz. I know their frequency because I was able to adjust my signal generator uh, to sneak up on them and just overlap its signal with the spur. And it's clearly some sort of artifact coming, most likely intermodulation products in one of the mixers. So I'll just do some math and see if I can nail it down. And then also there's a, a filter in there. I know that isn't as good as it should be and it's probably letting some of that garbage get by. So that'll be the, the focus there. And the last item on my list is a tracking generator. For some reason, it's decided to completely crap the bed in the last few days. It's been working fine all these uh, months I've been experimenting with it, but when I connected it up for this uh, video to try to demonstrate it working, it's now full of spurs. In fact, it's so bad it looks like a porcupine. Not really sure what's going on there. I'm a little concerned when I dig into it that it might be something serious, but I'll have to pull the lid off and start doing some probing and see what's going on there. Before I close this video, I wanted to show a quick demonstration of one useful diagnostic that you can use a spectrum analyzer for, and that's to look at the spurious emissions from a transmitter. And I scrounged through my junk box and I found a very simple little transmitter. It's called the Wonner. It's been around for decades, and I, I built this probably 20 plus years ago. Uh, construction is very simple. It's a single crystal uh, uh, frequency. It runs off a nine volt battery. It's got three transistors on it. It puts out barely a watt of power. Now, even a watt's too much to be putting into the spectrum analyzer. So I get to pull out this guy. This is the power tap that I made a few weeks ago. And it's a 40 dB uh, tap off of a transmitted signal. So one watt is plus 30 dBm. Dropping that by 40 dB takes it down to minus 10 dBm. And my spectrum analyzer has an adjustable attenuator at the front end that I can set to minus 20, which will put me right at minus 30 dBm if you're following the math here. And that's right at the reference level. So let's set this up and take a look at what the spurious emissions of something this simple looks like. And here's what the signal output of the Wonder looks like. Here's the fundamental. It's around minus 38 dBm, which scales to plus 22 dBm without the attenuation. And here's the first harmonic and second harmonic and third harmonic and so on. And the difference between the fundamental and the first harmonic is about 32 dB down. And the second harmonic is about 28 dB down. Now, if I were to judge this little guy by the most strict FCC Part 97 modern standard, neither of these two harmonics would meet the 43 dBm minimum suppression standard. 
So that's all I have for this episode. This project has been a very fun one to work on. It has no shortage, it seems, of ideas and improvements that I could think of making. And as I talked about, there are quite a few already that I will be tackling in future episodes. So look for those to be coming up in the future. And until next time, bye for now.